All right, folks, we're back. This is the Soil Block episode. You ready? I'm ready. Are you ready to school us in the Soil Blocks? I'm ready to give you everything you want to know and maybe more than one. This is like religion here in politics, I mean, right? No, it's not. No, oh, really? We're not, we're not touching that. Well, you already did by the intro. That's, we're just, I'm excited about Soil Blocks. Yeah. I've had a good day with it, you know? Yeah. So we're, we're going to cap it off and re-explain it again. All right. But. And, and it can be as lightning rod of a topic as politics mm-hmm. to some people. All right. What is the Soil Block simplest terms? Simplest terms... Soil block is compressing the plant medium into its own container. So you're taking the potting soil, you're applying pressure, it's already moist, so you kind of have a muddy consistency. That pressure basically compresses it into a a little block, and that's what you're starting your seeds in. And so it eliminates the need for cell trays and pots and things like that. Um, You'd still have a tray. Some people even use wooden boxes that they make as the base for what the blocks sit on top of, uh, but essentially is its own little all-in-one container. So when you say compress the medium, the first thing and the thing I see most often is the question is, what what makes up the mix? And I've come to the conclusion it's really could be almost anything that you would normally use to start your seeds in, just a couple of tweaks. Uh, I know you have a, a, a recipe that you like, based off your needs and your experience, but there's there's a lot of stuff that you could put in there. Yeah. There, there's so many different recipes that are out there. Um, there are peat-free recipes using coconut core. There's coconut core-free recipes if you want to use compost and other types of uh, more regionally sourced ingredients. It's a matter of what works for you, what's in line with the values that you want to have on your farm, whether you want to go peat-free or not. But the basics are the medium, something that holds water, uh, a fertilizer and the water. And, and, by fer- and by fertilizer, we're not talking not chemical fertilizer. Though you could go that route, um, but I mean like an organic source of nutrients. So blood meal, bone meal, chicken uh, uh, feather meal, uh, green sand, uh, other sources of uh, non chemically derived uh, fertility. So those are the main ingredients for a commercial potting mix. They tend to be made of. Uh, peat moss, vermiculite, and perlite. The vermiculite and the perlite uh, help hold water and air porosity, yeah. um, respect, uh, respectively. And you know you could substitute the peat moss for coconut core. You could substitute the perlite for rice holes. It, there's so many different recipes that are out there. Um, Ladbrook, the company that makes the soil blockers, uh, they have several recipes on their website that you can uh, find. Some people even just use the garden soil mix that with compost and use that as their medium. There's a lot of different recipes. It's just finding what works best for for you. Well, I'll be honest. I didn't hear anything after non-chemical fertility because I think that'd be a great name for a band. Oh, that is a good name. What is it? What <laughs> you say? He said non-chemical fertil- fertility. Non-chemical fertility. <laughs> <laughs> so, I like that. So, it, it, look, it goes to the very basic fundamental in, in which there's endless questions about where do I get my compost? Where do I get my soil amendments? The more local you can get, yeah. the less you're paying in shipping, the more of a relationship you can build with your supplier. You know what you're getting. Today, the ones that we built was a ProMix base. We had a ton of ProMix here. Yep. Uh, you brought a couple of, of amendments. Mm-hmm. So let's talk about your recipe that you like and that you use day in and day out. Yeah. So, so what I'm typically using right now is a seed starting mix. A seed starting mix is different than a potting soil in that it tends to be like sifted. So there's less larger aggregates in it, uh, big chunks of, you know, bark mulch and stuff like that. Um, Which you could certainly screen your own stuff. I know, I know Carl over there, he screens his stuff. You know, get some uh, welded mesh wire, dump the whole bag on it, sift it through um, and get all those big chunks out of it. That will make a better uh, soil block. You can add... It depends on the volume of soil I'm mixing. So I can't give a specific in terms of measurement, but I'm adding uh, blood meal and feather meal. And you can't give a specific because it's, well, I like what you said earlier today during when we made the video, it's, it starts out as science, but it very much becomes an art and yeah. a feel. Yeah. You know, you, you have some, some basic ingredients there. Yeah. You've done it so long, you know when it's right. And, and then we also made the distinction a bit ago that 
because we're dealing with organic materials and sometimes they they arrive wetter and sometimes they arrive drier sometimes you may leave them in your hoop house and they may dry out there's as you're mixing your water and it's more water than what you think yeah it's going to have a different feel and, and definitely you just have to you have to go with your gut mm -hmm. and and it comes down to anything else in farming you just have to try it you can wa listen yeah. to this podcast you can watch all of our videos you can watch every video on youtube but until you do it you're not going to get it yeah yeah, because even even in giving measurements of the fertility, like the the blood meal and things like that for nitrogen, it it depends on the mix you're starting with. Pro mix is going to have a different uh, fertility than Miracle Grow or any other name brand. Oh, don't say the MG word. <laughs> you know, just any sort of uh, yeah name brand mix is going to be slightly different, and so you have to adjust what you're adding to to accommodate for that. So it's best to to you know find uh, someone on online that maybe has that recipe that's been doing it for a long time and kind of has tried and true and then you can adjust from there and so uh the recipe that i uh wound up using at the the farm that i managed we, we bought every ingredient individually so we bought bales of peat moss bags of perlite bags of vermiculite and built the whole recipe from scratch because uh, we could do large uh volumes of it um so th those are the the go-to that i have is like if you just want to start something really basic getting seed starting mix that tends to have a, a not a lot of fertility in it add an organic fertilizer you can even use one that's kind of pelleted if you want to grind it up and mix it in um so just give it a little bit of a boost and then i like to add either compost or worm castings and that's going to add uh, some beneficial bacteria um, some stimulants for the plants and then also uh, kind of act as a bit of a glue to help hold the soil block together uh, so humeric acids are like the sticky greasy feel on like compost and that helps bind that block together really well I liked what you said um a bit ago about i keep saying a bit ago we folks we've been filming all day so this is <laughs> this is a reconclusion of everything we said in a condensed form but you did make the distinction that using kelp seaweed may not be a good idea it was, it was a fish emulsion yeah fish yeah. emulsion uh feeding like a liquid feed uh bottom watering with a liquid feed if that fish emulsion is just sitting in a Mm -hmm. tray stagnant um, especially if you're trying to do that in your doors like indoors you probably won't be married long yeah, yeah. <laughs> try, try to wash off that well funk, and you, you know? attract critters I yeah mean, i found like blood meal if the mice come in i mean uh, or rats rather i mean it's yeah yeah and it's unpleasant <laughs> yep so yeah so limiting uh like liquid feeds i'd really limit uh only maybe doing top watering if you're in a greenhouse or, or outdoors so that sort of thing so it's interesting i mean i we kind of moved away from using fertilizers in our mix because we, we do a, you know, when we will fertigate, you know, mm -hmm. at some point, but do you know maybe where and when, how long it takes for the plant to actually receive that in that soil block? Cause it's only in that block for a month, right? Is it actually yeah. receiving the benefit yeah, or is it, it more for the longevity when you take that block and put it, in the ground? It's a little bit of both. So, um, things like what, well, what's, what's amazing is how long it kind of takes for, nitrogen to become plant available yeah so like let's say a cover crop um you've, you know, you've planted a bunch of wheat or um uh, vetch or something like that and then you decide to terminate it it takes about 30 to 45 days for that crop to decompose and turn into plant available nitrogen and the same is is true with the blood meal and the bone meal and the feather meal the blood meal is a lot quicker it takes about uh 10 to 15 days to start huh. becoming uh bioavailable to plants um, because bacteria have to make all these different changes in the chemical composition of that of that nitrogen to transform it into a way that plants can take it up. Uh, feather meal takes a bit longer, maybe like 30 to 45 days. And so the blood meal and the feather meal can be a good one-two punch of like early nitrogen and gotcha. late nitrogen. And the advantage to both of those things is unlike chemical nitrogen, like ammonia, is that they don't burn the plants because the right. bacteria have to break it down slowly. Um, so it's like a slow release. So 30 days is probably, you know, that's, that's only four weeks. Right. That's about you the time the plant needs it. Because yeah, when you first, plant needs a lot of people, exactly. people think even like with microgreens and things like you need to fertilize, you know, but really, I mean, up until the plant's probably three, four weeks old, yeah. it's not really needing any juices or so to speak or any yeah. nutrients. Exactly. So about that time is what you're saying is when mm -hmm. they're going to start receiving, yep. being able to take a so yeah, so of that. The timing works well. So it's starting to become plant right. uh, available as that plant starts to fill out the soil block. Yeah. And then especially, and it will continue to be available 
even after you transplant it. How long then, I mean, uh, how long does that last then, that that nutrients that you put in that block then, before you need to feed it again, if you will? Yeah, yeah. So so because the, you know, that's getting a bit into like field prep uh, techniques. So like because that feather meal takes about 30 days to uh, be plant available, what I'll do is is in my seed starting calendar, I know I have my transplant date, but then I have a month before that, it'll notify me, hey, it's time to, to prep this field. And that's when I'm starting to lay out beds, uh, add my feather meal, and that way it's becoming unlocked 30 days later whenever I'm transplanting. And then I've also been managing weeds that, that month before and doing stale seed bedding techniques. And then I'm planting into a field that's full of nitrogen, has no weeds, and I'm using my soil block so i got healthy, happy transplants that just take off. Yeah. Now, since you're working on that calendar, this does bring me to another. We did a lot of research figuring out what questions to ask, and, and one of the ones I kept seeing over and over again is, how far in advance can you make your soil blocks? Um, there's there's a chemical breakdown that may happen quicker than you want if you pre-batch these things, plus yeah. a care and maintenance situation. Yeah, yeah. So one of the one of the things I didn't know about this until I, I really you know, got into to mixing the soils is that most soils have a wetting agent. A wetting agent is what helps uh, peat moss absorb water. Once peat moss gets wet, it stays wet forever. But if it's totally dried out, uh, if you've ever just dumped a bale of peat moss into even a bucket of water, it floats on top. It doesn't want to get wet. Mm. Um, and so a wetting agent helps the water soak into the potting soil. Um, for organic farms, a lot of those potting soils don't have that. Um, and so if you let your soil blocks totally dry out, like after you've made them, uh, it can be really uh, troublesome to try and get them to soak water back up and, and get resaturated. Also, if you manage to do it, they could still kind of fall apart. They'll kind of crumble apart as they have now contracted and then soak up all this water and they'll just kind of slump apart. The other option is to keep those soil blocks um, wet, but then bacteria and fungus are still breaking down and using all the nitrogen that's in there to break down the, the other organic components in there. So the best thing is to make them fresh, though we did kind of wonder what it would be like to make them and freeze them. I was just wondering if you put it in a cooler or something. Because yeah. uh, I, I wondered about, because that would keep them wet, it would uh, keep their shape, and it would keep all the uh, fertilizer intact, and you can make a bunch through the winter, throw them in a the freezer. Well, my only thing on that is, A, it's untested. I'm going to try it there. I'm and, trying it when and, I go. We'll, let, we'll let you know. But, but two, I, I would think that that water might expand a little bit as yeah. it freezes mm. and possibly break ah, it up. Yeah. 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 All right. So, Ex experiment to follow. Turn yeah, that, that'd be interesting three. to hear. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but this is something I've always wondered. Does the nutrients, you, you kind of touched on it. Um, so, if, if you've got all your nutrients in there, you're saying that the bacteria and fungi can actually take that out? Yeah. So, like, eventually it'll just go away, dissolve? Uh, um, yeah, back into the atmosphere. Really? Mm -hmm. <laughs> which, is, which is kind of one of the things that, uh, like, mixing wood chips. You know, you can use wood chips as a mulch, but generally it's not recommended to incorporate them because then the right. fungus will rob nitrogen from the soil to help break down the, yeah. the carbon that's been added to the soil. Okay. And so, they can do the same thing in, the, in potting mixes and... Things like that. Yeah. So maybe a couple of weeks at most, maybe yeah. not even. Maybe yeah. I mean, I, I just try and make them you know, right. that week even. Just in time kind of, yeah. Yeah. yeah you, you could probably start a week in advance if you wanted right. to. Like if you had a lot, if you're going to do like a whole high tunnel of, of plants and you need to make a few hundred soil, large soil blocks or yeah. something like that, you could definitely start on a Monday and be ready to seed or transplant or whatever uh, by Friday or something like that. All right. So let's talk, uh, let's talk about the water. So assuming you've picked your mix and you're happy with the amendments, concrete mixing tubs that are like, what, 30 inches by 18 to 20, mm -hmm. 24 inches wide, the black, and they've got some tapered ends on them. That's, I've never seen anybody not use that yeah. to, to mix their, their soil blocks. So you have your mix, you have your seeds ready to go, you have your uh, trays ready to put them in, you have your tub. There's a lot of water that goes in here. And again, we, we can't tell you, hey, for every gallon of compost, you put two gallons of water in mm -hmm. because it's a feel situation. So give us some tips on how much water to uh, start and then what the finished water might look like. Yeah, yeah. So or, like, or the like, finished like, amount. Like you said earlier, it's like it starts off as a science, becomes an art. 
And just like if you're baking, it's like you can follow a recipe, but if you've been doing it for a while, you know, like the consistency isn't, this isn't right. I need to add more flour or, or, you know, you can feel those variables. Um, and so that's a bit how the soil blocks are. We want to add enough water to where whenever I squeeze it, there's water coming out. But whenever I let go, it basically holds its shape like a snowball. I can even throw it in the air and it you know, keep, keeps its shape. That's when I know I've got enough water in there. The larger soil blocks do need more water than the smaller soil blocks um, in order to kind of hold their shape because there's just so much material packed into that large blocker. Um, what I say is that you need like basically a cookie dough consistency, kind of smearable. And, and, and look, people, this is not terrible. I mean, this is a this is kind of a fun thing to play with. Yeah. And yeah, if yeah. you're gardeners, you're, you're like getting your hands yeah, in the you dirt. Should, you should mm-hmm. like playing in the dirt. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, you just you just kind of mix it um, and get that kind of cookie dough, chocolate chip cookie dough consistency. And that's what's going to help it really pack into the soil block whenever you apply the pressure and release the blocks, they'll, they'll stick together. And if you if get they, too much water, you just throw in some dry material. Yeah. Right. Yeah. If, if you start getting like puddles of water in that, that thing, I just take a handful of the dry material. Um, that's also why there's not that exact ratios because you may have to kind of, kind of play with it. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and you did make the distinction that uh, you were making a lot of soil blocks and going over and over and over the same material all day mm-hmm. at, a, at a conference. Yeah. And, and basically that the more you worked it and the more it broke down, similar to Play-Doh, you know, I'd, you can play with Play-Doh and once you warm it up and start playing with it a lot, it just, it gets better. Yeah. 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 yeah you kind of uh, break apart the larger pieces of peat that are in there and it becomes easier to work. So you just kind of have to mix it for a minute. More consistent. Um, yeah. Less, less bigger voids, I guess. Yep. So we're out to the point. I, I do want to talk about the soil blocks in that there's, it's, it's a mechanical situation. I'll, if, if you're listening to this, there's a, a, the, this very same conversation in video form along with all of our supplemental videos that we shot today. So it's a, it's a metal box that has a spring in there that you basically, the compression that you talked about, you're pressing and loading this cube and picking up and pressing and loading it, and you're putting more and more and more matter into a shaped cavity mm-hmm. that then you press down and it goes out of that cavity onto the tray yeah. and that's what makes the compression so it's, it's a mold it's it's a, me- yeah, a mechanical it's mold. mold basically mm-hmm. yep. yeah yep. Like, like almost making a brick right. is, is kind of what it would be comparable to mm-hmm. um so yeah it makes that mold um what's what's a gr- such a great design about the soil blocking system from ladbrook is they those bricks fit into each other so it makes potting on really easy so the smallest size brick fits into the medium size brick which fits into the largest size brick that's big enough to accommodate you know two foot tall tomato plant um and so that that makes the whole potting on process and what we talked about earlier about having you know the right amount of fertilizer in there when you're potting on you're introducing that plant into fresh medium that has fertilizer in it and it's going to be able to root quickly and take off and and do well did you hear that pot on yeah pot on you know pot up Pot up. I we, did, we did a video when we, when we had the five by five uh, pots originally. Uh-huh. <laughs> this is the end of the, we're we're going on sixteen hours here, so I'm starting to get a little delirious. <laughs> but do you remember what happened? Is you could not say you you I got know, so tripped up on pot up, pot on, pot this, pot because that. Because we always on. on our farm we use the word pot up. Like we don't use pot on. Uh-huh. I mean, pot up is what we use, and and so he kept making fun of me. So then I tried training my brain to say pot on, you know, and, and pot it up. It still just, couldn't do it. No, I couldn't. <laughs> so, but it's a great video. I, I wondered if it was like a if that's like a. It's got to be regional, right? Yeah, regional thing. Yeah, I don't know. yeah. I, I, to me, it I, just I, made sense. And, like and then I got a, up pot. Yeah, yes, up pot. Yeah. yeah, up pot. Yeah, pot up, pot on. On pot. <laughs> I like inside Pot on. It probably came from like rock on, you know, like you won't ever say rock up, you know. So I, I, I see the connection maybe. Just say so, something. But I got a question. So, you know, the, the concept also you get some air pruning. That's like mm-hmm. part of the, the yeah. soil blocks, right? But then when you put them, when you pot up, <laughs> I'll pot on, <laughs> on into, pot up. <laughs> into the next block size, uh-huh. I, you, you still have that barrier. So do you actually push that in so that barriers and air barriers you don't, you don't have to they'll overcome that really quickly because it's how do they so, not do that though in their natural state when they're already in the smaller ones they're sitting right next to the and they will grow into each other yeah, a little I've bit i've seen that some at the especially the tomato plants the ones that are really deep rooted yeah. you know and, yeah. and to take a half a step back as 
as a root's coming and it it's hitting the edge of the mold, the root terminates mm-hmm. and then starts shooting off branches. Yeah, yeah. So or whenever, turning into itself. Right. Yeah. Well, so when you put it back in there, if they're so close that a little bit can get in there, then all those it branches, senses. instead of three or four getting in there, all of those branches that you made start yeah, working their way goes in. out. Mm-hmm. Some, yeah, there's got to be some magical science in there that. Well, it's triggers. it's like you put it in there in a little pat and little pat and you're good. Right. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, it's a pretty snug fit. Like whenever you slide it down in there, they fit almost exactly into. It's almost like they're designed that way. They were designed. That way. Um, yes, yeah, so that, that makes the potting on process easier. The the air pruning is probably the biggest uh, reason why someone might want to consider soil blocks. Um, air pruning is where you know the root hits that edge, like you just said, and, it, and terminates, sends roots in new direct and new directions. And what's great about that is like when I have the tomatoes in the large uh, blocks. And when I say large block, I'm talking like as big as a five inch pot. Is is that how big those those pots are? Those are five inch pots. I would say that. Um... A, it's probably it's it's made in France, so it's probably in millimeters. Oh, that's true. But it, but it, <laughs> I, I would say it's it's around four inches. Yeah. It, it's a complete weird side note. You know what I found found out this week is in Great Britain, if if somebody says, "Hey, how tall are you?" They use feet and inches. And so I was thinking about. I I told Wendy. I said, "What if what if that was the opposite of it?" And if any time somebody said, "How how tall are you?" Instead yeah. of saying six one, I'm. I'm five thousand centimeters. I don't know yeah. how big a centimeter. Yeah. I, that trips it's me up. Two and a half per inches. Yeah. Anyways, I, just, they I, I weight, thought that they was neat. By stones. Yeah. Like how, I think how, that's oh, weight. really? Yeah. Is that weight though? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Coming in at twenty-five stones or whatever. <laughs> I don't know. You know that's like, strange. Well, for their athletes and stuff. And like, hmm. Stone. Interesting. Anyway, I think it's mm-hmm. slightly smaller than a five-inch yeah. pot. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, it's it's a significant. It's a block. lot of soil. But what's yeah. a, what's great about the air pruning is like when I do my tomatoes in there and I get this you know large robust plant ready to go in right the day after the last frost. Um, I have roots all the way at the top of the block, you know, and I can see them at the on, on the edge of every side of the block. Um, versus when I've done them in containers, those roots just head straight to the bottom and just you know run around yeah. in circles. And so you're using all that soil more efficiently, and so you get a bigger plant with less soil. Uh, because of that air pruning effect and that's also going to help like you mentioned going from when you're potting on and those roots immediately jump into the the next block that you planted them in they do the same thing whenever you put them in the ground and so you get less transplant shock and so they take to being transplanted a lot easier than popping plants out of trays disturbing the roots or you know that the roots are all new fresh and exposed um and so you have less uh you know, kind of time wasted in the field because the crop just immediately starts growing. I really like that for fruiting crops because mm-hmm. uh, you you made the distinction that if you're starting indoors and then you're moving these blocks in a succession up to that bigger block, mm-hmm. by the time it's the first frost date, your plant could be how big? Yeah, like, like wow. almost two feet. Yeah. So imagine plant, imagine on. transplanting a two a two foot tomato, cucumber, pepper eggplant at the last frost date right and you know man it's got to be setting fruit already oh yeah 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 cucumbers will have will have harvestable fruit within like two to three weeks after transplant i mean if that thing's in a high time i mean you're going to market way quicker oh yeah yeah you'll beat everyone by month and then you can have a higher price point you can establish your customer base for the year earlier um so there's a lot of advantages to that the soil blocks what is so beautiful about it is that it's so scalable like we had it works perfect for the home gardener um, that you can start a lot of plants in a really small space. For our 1,200 square foot backyard garden, started about 2,000 plants, and we did that on just four trays because uh, each tray can hold over 240 plants uh, with those little mini 20 blocks. And so for a home gardener, it saves a ton of space. But then for a, a market gardener, it's still a scalable tool. There's stand up soil blockers where you can make a lot more blocks with just one pool. Soil blocks can sometimes be seen like it is newer in America, uh, but a lot of organic farmers have adopted it. Elliot Coleman, again, brought it over from, from France. And in Europe, it's still kind of the industry standard for large, when I say large, like hundreds of acres of vegetables. Mm-hmm. They're using soil blockers. They have large machines that like crank them out in trays at a time, um, you know, hundreds of thousands of soil blocks at a time. But that's what, that's what they're using. That's commonplace. And so it's just really interesting. Like we, we don't have, 
the tools that mechanically make soil blocks like that in America at all, um, let alone the tools that transplant them. And so they have transplanters that transplant soil blocks and all, all that kind of yeah. stuff. It's that's just, <clears throat> that's so kind of where I went to is, you know, for us, just from a practicality perspective, like, you know, a, a lot of the stuff we plant is in within under landscape fabric. So, mm -hmm. I mean, taking a plug from a, from like a 72 or 50 cell tray or even a two inch pot is about the max that we can, you know, mm -hmm. put inside there. So, um, that's, it's a great, if, if you've got the weed and the control or weed control and the, the ability to, to do that. But if you get into a five inch, I mean, to transplant that into a, you know, e even if you're in the open field, I mean, you got to, that's a pretty big hole. You got to dig the right. I mean, I mean, I guess if you got really loose soil and, you yeah, know, we, we were just broad fork before we transplant. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, it kind of goes back to like the tool conversation in the last podcast of, you know, how do we reduce tools? So like, with our broad fork, we broad fork ahead of transplanting on our uh, larger soil blocks, and we just do them by hand. And that's with a, a stony clay soil, but it just the soil's been improved so much over time. We've been able to like eliminate all the landscape fabric. We don't use landscape fabric anymore because we've done the stale seed bedding and got rid of uh, the weeds and the grasses. And so all those systems just be like build upon themselves mm -hmm. and, and make it easier and easier. And so yeah, so for our our high tunnels I'm, at the farm that I managed. Um, we were strictly no-till in those in those spaces, so um, we were able to get rid of all the landscape fabric. We only used a broad fork in there uh, to lift and loosen the soil, and then yeah, we could just pull by hand, put that block in there. And another cool thing about the soil blocks too that I've even done is I'll, I'll even transplant them kind of high. I I don't bury my mm. tomatoes deep. I don't do I don't lay them on their sides. You can almost even set that soil block right on top of the soil and it would root and mm -hmm. just go almost uh, like a mounding effect then yeah natural yeah a natural mounting effect and we do that in the winter i, I learned to that helped deter slugs we take our soil blocks and we transplant the lettuce in the winter we, we transplant them halfway out of the ground and it kept the base of the plant with more airflow and away from the slugs um and so we had less like rot and things like that when we first got them in because again i i never used it so I'm, I'm not, that's why you're here. I'm not the expert on this, but uh, I didn't realize the importance of the, there's a long and a short nib, mm -hmm. you know, a little dibbler, uh -huh. and then there's the square dibbler. So the square dibbler you would put in there if you know you're going to transplant into a bigger one. And then there's a shallow one for smaller seeds and a deeper one for mm -hmm. bigger seeds, cantaloupe, watermelon, sunflower seeds, that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so it really accommodates, you know, even if you only had that medium blocker, you could do, you know, almost all your crops in that size. It might be a bit bigger of a soil block for lettuce. It might be a bit small for tomatoes, um, but it would generally do about everything. Um, it's that small soil blocker that really helps you save a lot of space because you can start smaller seeds. Um, you, you can even take those smaller soil blocks, put them directly in your garden. Uh, you can start all your lettuce, uh, green onions, We'll even multi-seed radishes, so we plant our radishes, uh, five seeds for each soil block, and then we transplant it. Uh, we're able to get radishes in like 15 days after transplant. And you just harvest that whole cluster of radishes already bunched together. So the smaller soil block saves a lot of space, and then the largest soil block uh, helps you get bigger plants in the ground a lot earlier. A couple of things I, I learned and really enjoyed watching you do today is, is one, if you did, let's say, a set of 20 soil blocks in the in the micro 20, and you had a little germination germ, germination issue. You can take that one out and just replace it with another block. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and and thinking about any type of mass cell tray, it it would be a pain to kind of get that in oh, and yeah. out and replace, and then you have a shorter one. I mean, yeah. just I like that aspect, and then I also like the aspect of. Yeah, this comes in groups of 20s or groups in four, depending on which blocker you have. But watching you divide that, especially yeah, from a gardener, like a home gardener perspective, mm -hmm. hey, I got one tray. I'm going to kind of separate these out a little bit. I'm only going to do eight tomatoes, four peppers. Mm -hmm. I think it's a real neat modular way in one tray to have an entire garden. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you can almost like look at the tray and see the whole garden in miniature of what, what's mm -hmm. about to go outside. Um, and we'll use like a, uh, a brownie spatula 
Now we, it's it's like a miniature spatula scraper, yeah, scraper, and then you can you know really easily divide those and even pick up some of the soil blocks if you need to move them around. Um, but yeah, that that's that's a good technique. Also, that you can space them out as they get bigger is is another uh, great aspect of the soil blocks. So you know if you have um, tomatoes in like a 72 cell tray or something like that uh, and it's been a minute they need to go outside but not not quite ready yet uh, they begin competing with each other for light and you can't scoot each of those plants further away from each other you can only scoot trays further away from each other with the soil blocks you could add you could literally move every single block half an inch away from each other so that those plants don't get too leggy uh, and you're able to you know, have a more compact plant and, transplant and again uh, the fear is these things are going to fall apart but I mean, after mm. I've been playing with it for the last few months, and then having you today, I, I and watching you take even the large one and chunk it up in the air yeah. and catch it, they're starting. They're yeah. it's like it, I liken it to a snowball. Mm -hmm. You pack it up. There's no reason for that to hold together under the except for the compression and the moisture content of it. Just keeps it held together. Yeah, and then once those roots take into it, then it holds right. it together like yeah. rebar and concrete, and it's it's never going to break. And it goes, I've, I've also seen the question of well, which soil blocker should I get? And it's at this point, if I had to only pick one, it would be the, the 20, uh -huh. but I, I can't see the 20 without the four at this yeah. point. Um, yeah. I was, I was wondering about the larger one and uh -huh. we're going to start carrying them after watching Jill at her place going through the whole process mm -hmm. one day. Like now I get you have to see it. Yeah, like yeah. you really do have to see it. You should probably explain what that twenty versus the four mean. In so the, context. the the twenty <laughs> has twenty mini soil block and not what they're uh, th uh, three quarter of, a, of an inch cubed. Yep. 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 And then the uh, four is a straight line of four inch and a half, two uh, inches. Two inches. Yeah. yeah. And then the the big one's about a four mm -hmm. four and a half inch block and one single. Yeah. And even those four ones, um, we experimented with that early on. We don't, we haven't used it anymore. We've just been using the trays, but those fit uh, or the the cell trays. But those those four inch blocks are still very much designed to conform to the standard ten twenty trays, like that yellow cell. I think we did forty six today, right inside of one. Yeah. So the the ten twenty trays, the, the mesh bottom trays from Bootstrap, they they hold two hundred and forty of the mini blocks. Yeah. You could squeeze in forty six of the. Uh, medium sized blocks, I think eight of the largest size blocks. Yeah. So mm -hmm. that kind of shows you how big those blocks are. There's only mm -hmm. eight in the 10 by 20 tray. And even even loaded with the, those big blocks fully saturated, it was still less than 15 pounds. So yeah, really that weighed. was what we, we wound up weighing with, like, we we're like, you know, because we're always testing how strong the trays right. are. Yeah. It's like, how much does this actually weigh? And it was, ours was 15, but we figured another three pounds once it has the plants in there and it's fully wetted out, mm -hmm. you know. Of course, the trays didn't have any problem, but there, there's a lot of weight to them because right. of the added water. Yeah, but you need the stronger trays for sure. I mean, oh, you, yeah. you couldn't go. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's good. You would just yeah. have to, you know, and, and maybe the, go through them. There, there are, are other trays that I've used and like not, not like anything like these bootstrap trays that mm. they, like we loaded it, we weighed it, and then I held it like on the edge yeah. long ways to see if it would, if it would buckle in it. Folded like a cheap suit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's no point in going through all this effort if it's going to not make it yeah, right. outside during yeah. the hardening off oh, process. Yeah. Mm -hmm. For sure. Uh, and, and that's another advantage with the soil blocks is that they're easier to, to transport like out to the field. There's a soil blocker that makes 35 one and one quarter inch blocks. And I can pick up the whole thing on my hand and carry out 35 plants without a tray like out into the field and then break them apart transplant them and then i don't have any trays to he says them. that but i say just use a tray <laughs> <laughs> now while you're here the seating of it yeah so we did we did uh, uh we did, we had a head-to-head -head race earlier in which we made soil blocks together uh you know i filled a tray he filled a tray and then he used his drop seeder and then i did it by hand it was significant i mean it was night and day man yeah uh, he had time to read a book yeah <laughs> or the Thrasher skate, Skateboard Magazine. Of course. It's, it's the only <laughs> literature we actually had up here. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. The, the, the drop seeder came about uh, from my time working um, uh, for that farm. We did about a thousand heads of lettuce a week, and we were doing that by hand, uh, and just like, this has, there has to be a better way. There's not enough podcasts in the world, man, <laughs> to yeah. listen to oh, doing I that. I know. It's funny you say it, like, all, all my apprentices listen to like murder podcasts. 
they like brought I, I bought a Bluetooth speaker for them. I'm like, I bet they'll enjoy it. Look how music. peaceful the farm is. Look how yeah, peaceful right. the farm is. And they're like, and the crime was committed and, <laughs> and all this stuff was like, <laughs> y'all are killing me. Um, so yeah, so we had to seed a bunch of lettuce. We had bought another uh, drop seeder from another company and I, I just wasn't real happy with it. And I started working with the Arkansas Innovation Hub in Little Rock uh, to do some prototypes. Um, and it wasn't until I, I left Heifer a year later where we actually, I finished out the prototype myself and we got it laser cut out of acrylic. Um, so it's precision cut. The acrylic is scratch and impact resistant. And then the, the design of it is like no other drop seeder that's out there um, that it uses uh, magnets as both the spring and the feature that holds the plates together. Uh, because I was, as I was using these other drop seeders, I would get seeds caught between the plates. I would have the plates get crooked uh, in the little grooves and break the acrylic. The, the price point was, was higher. And so I just wasn't happy with what was out there. And so I made these. And so now I mean, you're easily cutting your t in half, most likely a third. But the best thing is that you're not getting fatigued. So like whenever you sit there, especially if you ask a, an employee to sit there and, hey, can you hand seed a thousand heads of lettuce every week? Um, then you want to do I, one at a time or you want to do 20 at a time? Yeah, do you want to yeah. do one at a time, 20 times, 35 at a time? And now with the, the newer drop seeders we're coming out for the standard 10 by 20 trays, you can do 200 at a time. So with five clicks, you've just seeded a thousand heads of lettuce. Well, and plus just the, you, you're likely saving costs on seed. You know, some of these Salanova seeds and, uh, you know, are pretty expensive. Yeah. And so if you yeah. can assure that you're only getting, yep. you know, the amount of seeds you want. Yeah. And that, that, that's another thing too, that I, that I kind of built into the, the design of the drop seeders is a lot of time we, we, it's important to singulate. I mean, like you just have one seed per cell. You don't have to go back and thin out. Oh, I did too many mm -hmm. tomatoes in this, you know, in this tray. Now I got to go back and pick out extra tomato plants and especially the cost of seed, but then the, the labor involved. I want to be able to simulate, but in other times I may even want to multi-seed. Um, so multi-sowing or multi-seeding is where you purposefully put three uh, beet seeds in a, in a tray or five radish seeds or five uh, green onion seeds uh, in a tray. And that way you're sowing, um, you're transplanting basically clusters of plants a little bit further apart. So it makes cultivation easier, makes transplanting faster, and it makes harvesting faster because you can just pick up that bunch of green onions, throw a rubber band around it, spray off the dirt and your your set. Oh, yeah. um, and so using the, the drop seeder, you can control exactly how many seeds are going into every cell every time you click. Seeds are in, they're in the trays. I think the second question by far, besides how do you actually make this, is how to water mm -hmm. the trays. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're in a tray. It, you just pour water in it, basically, or, yeah. you, or you can mist it. So, But I, I know that's... Um, get a little bit more technical. So what, yeah. what are some best practices yeah, for getting these guys watered? Some best practices, especially there's no roots. When you first put that seed in there, there's no roots to hold that block together. And then a lot of times we're using our soil blocks for our, our cut flowers that need light to germinate. And so we're, we aren't even covering up the soil blocks and the seed is just sitting right on top of that block. Um, so we can use a fine mist, a really fine mist to wet the top of the block. Um, but you tend to have to like, mist and then wait a second and then mist again mm -hmm. and wait a second to get enough volume of water to fill that block so we found a bottom watering for the first several weeks just tends to be the best practice and what we do is we take the mesh bottom tray and set that on top of a solid bottom tray add the water to the solid bottom tray and set the mesh bottom inside typically when you make the soil block there's already enough moisture in the soil block to help the seed germinate uh, even if you add more material on top, there's usually enough moisture in that block to to wet that material as well. And so you don't really need to water after you seed, which is also kind of nice. You just seed and then stick it on the rack or in the greenhouse table. And But when it does come time to water and you get some germination or you see your blocks are getting a little dry, uh, you just lift that mesh bottom up. I just give it like a little you know, five degree twist to where the corners sit on the edges of the solid bottom tray. And that gives me kind of a, a gap between the two. I can pour, I think we found that uh, about three cups of water totally fills the bottom of that, that tray. Uh, and then I can twist or you know, realign my two trays. And then the mesh bottom tray is going to sit down in that water. It's going to absorb and saturate the uh, soil blocks. And in about maybe 10 minutes, maybe even probably even, even less, 
uh, they're fully saturated and I can lift it back out of the water, give it another little, you know, five degree twist and set it up out of the water. By twist, you're picking up and just turning it. Just turning it to where it sits on the edges of the uh, bottom tray. The reason why that's important is, one, I don't want them to just sit in the water for too long and become saturated and the water becomes stagnant. And then two, I still need that air pruning effect on the bottom. If I left them in the tray, mm -hmm. um, then those roots would just go down into the water. Effect. Yeah. They what? Hydroponic effect. Yeah, yeah. It'd be like a hydroponic kind of mm -hmm. setup. And then whenever I go to pull that soil block, I'm ripping all those roots off Root, that have yeah. grown into. Can you explain? The tray. That you, you, I'm not getting the visual when you say you lift them up. You're just saying you, you literally pick up the mesh tray and you turn it so it's um, sitting suspended. On the lips, yeah. So it's sit, sitting on the upper edge of the. Got it. The you could tray. always watch the video. Yeah. That we're going to put out. <laughs> I might do that. You and everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> I know some of these things are hard to visualize. Whenever. Yeah. Uh, via podcast, but um, yeah, that, and that's generally our, our method whenever we have the trays indoors, especially in the early spring, we're only watering like maybe every three days when they go outside. Um, it might be every day, uh, especially on really warm, sunny days. Um, if we're starting our crops for the fall, those smaller blocks will dry out a lot faster than the bigger blocks. So they might even need to get watered twice a day. It's kind of the, I hear the complaint of soil blocks that they dry out really quick. And they they will they may dry out more quickly than what's in a tray because there's more sides exposed to the air. But kind of the beauty of it is that they they let you know when they need water. Um, a lot of trays, you know, you may even have algae growing on top of uh, a cell or a pot, but then you pull it up and it's like completely bone dry underneath. The soil block is consistent throughout, so if it looks dry on the outside, it's dry on the inside. And you know, it's time to water. So they kind of while they do dry out a little bit faster. They also signal to you when it's time to water. Um, so it can you can use it as an advantage. And again, it's just one of those things that to play with, to determine, you know, there's it it does sound like from week to week and from different stages of the plant to different stages of the plant that the watering needs is is gonna have little adjustments along the way. Uh and I did take a, a half a step ahead of time before the watering and that after we seed. Uh, you were putting azomite, or you could put perlite, or even just some some dried potting soil material uh -huh. to cover the holes or the or the the dibbles. Should the seed require it? Yeah, yeah, that, that'll help keep that moisture on top of the seed and help it germinate. With it. To the watering point, we mentioned earlier that the soil block does a, a lot better after transplanting. We've already kind of covered that pretty good. I mean, that's. I would like to think that this would be harder than what it is, but really what we just described, that's that's kind of the beauty of it. And what I learned today is you get your consistency right, you play around with it, you compress your block, you put it into the tray, you seed it, cover it, water it appropriately on those two things, and then whenever it's time to transplant, there you go. Yep. You've got a, a great plug. Yeah, and, and they'll kind of tell you too whenever it's time to transplant. You'll see more and more roots kind of on the outside of the block you know, it's either time to pot up or put it in the ground. So yeah, that's kind of one. It's very simple. It's, it sounds pretty simple. And it's like they, the plants will let you know what they need. They look dry. They need water. If they, if they got a lot of roots on the outside, they need to go into another container. Yeah. And that's not an equipment problem. That's a, uh, let's pay attention to our crop issue, yeah. which yeah. as the, I, I, I say this almost every podcast as the farm owner, it's your responsibility to make sure everything is as it's supposed to be. Yeah. And look, if if something happens and you mess up a tray, then you start over. Mm -hmm. Nobody died. Yep. You're going to be all right. Yep. And that's, what's that old adage, like the, the greatest fertilizers of farmer's footsteps? Like if you can put eyes on things regularly and just observe, mm -hmm. like yeah. you're just going to do so much better. And understand that that's going to change from season to season. I mean, you may, you're going to have to water more in the summer if you're, if you're starting your Fall crops in the summer might require a little bit more care than if you're indoors starting right. for the winter. Right. Yeah, and so like if, if you're listening to the podcast now, like, and you're a beginner gardener, I want to encourage you, like, don't look for the quick answers, but just become a scientist, like a student of nature in the world, and just observe as much as you can. Yeah. You'd be astounded to just like how much you'll grow in a season if you just take the time to slow mm -hmm. down and just watch the plant, watch what insects are coming to the plant, watch what it does when it gets hot, and you just learn so much that way. Yeah. Um, th there's no just like quick answers to a lot of this stuff. It just takes time and experience. Yeah. I think that's one of the key components of farming that, um, 
that you touched on is observation. I've been, it's something that I've, because I'm, I don't want to say I'm hands off, but you know, as I was telling you earlier, like I feel like I just sit around and write checks out nowadays, you know, like I don't get to get in there all the time yeah. because of the model that we have. Mm -hmm. And, and I told my wife this probably, it might've been six months ago, but I'm like, I don't, I've, I've, I've lost touch of the observation, like how mm -hmm. to now to be able to iterate, you know, because I, I, I've stepped back so much to, you know, kind of the check writing mm -hmm. that I'm not now able to progress because of the that whole intangible yet tangible layer of observation. Yeah. I mean, to be to know what your plants need, what's going on. Uh, I just shared earlier today, like I, I hadn't even been up in the Gothic tunnel and all the eggplant were laid over and they're full of mites, you know, like you've got to be, you know, mm -hmm. aware and have a have a pulse or a thumb on you know everything that's going on at least from an observation level yeah you know not necessarily doing everything once you get into a commercial stage mm -hmm. but observation is such a yeah uh, you know something that people don't really think about oh, yeah. as a as a um whatever a task or a uh you know something that you have to have in mm -hmm. every part of, or every part of the day you know yeah. that was one of the the tasks like for our, our farm apprentices or farmers in training at the farm that i managed uh, that was the first task of the day. We'd have a, a on farm meeting, and then we had these things that we called like task tickets, basically what needed to be accomplished for the day. But I would kind of already know what needed to be accomplished for the day. But I challenged every apprentice to do maybe just a ten minute field walk, and then give me a list of all the things you feel like need to happen. See if there's anything we're missing, or see if there's anything they're missing. Um, and that was super helpful. And try to instill in them that habit of like, I just need to walk the property, you know, just like if, and it's, it's just important for vegetable farmers to do that as it is people who do like livestock. Like you just got to put your eyes on your animals and is everyone walking? Okay. Is everyone looking okay? Like and you just do the same thing with the, the plants. Well, boys, uh, again, uh, another week has passed. As long as we've been doing this, I learned a ton today. And I think one of our commitments from bootstrap farmer, I didn't feel like I knew enough to speak with authority on the subject, so we we invited you here, and thankfully you came <laughs> to to help us through this. I learned a bunch through osmosis. We we're able to share everything we learned today with everybody listening. Got to have you meet new people, and we all became friends tonight. It's just been a great day. We start at seven; it's eleven o'clock, <laughs> and I and I love it. I I feel like we could probably go another hour, but it's also Saturday. <laughs> You've all I had a crazy week. You got a long drive, uh, man. I can't thank you enough for sharing all your knowledge with us. It's it's I been a, it. a very me. very entertaining and, and fun day. So, did you learn anything? A ton, I really <laughs> did. I hope my wife listens to this, especially on the cut flowers and the and the overwintering. You know, on a previous oh, yeah. one that we chatted about, she's she's always got she's she wants to do more of the flower stuff and she's asked about the winter and i'm just like i don't think that we could do it but uh mm -hmm. so yeah took quite a few nuggets away from today yeah. so certainly appreciate it yeah you no know, i think it's two-way street i mean got you out of your shell a little bit and mm -hmm. saw some new stuff and, and yeah. look that's the whole purpose of of why we're so interested to get people together is it's kind of what we said about visiting the manufacturers and having all these partners is, is you just learn more and more and more as fast as this industry is going for such an old craft, right? And we're all trying to be the very best that we can be to, to still be able to learn, to still be able to push boundaries. I love it. That's why we do what we do. So, all right, that's it. <laughs> we're going to call it a day, folks. But we'll uh, safe travels and we'll see you next week. Mm -hmm. So we'll pop them on or pop them up or up pop or up pot, whatever term you like to use Let's there. Start over. <laughs> You're going a million miles an hour. Am I really? Oh, I should have put that coffee down. <laughs> <laughs>